All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Andy. Yes, I am um, a fellow member of the, uh, the, the Surrey branch. Um, I've probably been a member of the Western Front Association for about seven or eight years now, um, starting with really the, um, the centenary of the, of the First World War. Now, you can see the title here, Discipline Within the AIF, AIF on the Western Front. Last week, I had uh, lunch with a friend, and after I told him I was doing this talk tonight, and he stopped me quite quickly, and he said, Greg, two recommendations here. First of all, change the title. It should be Indiscipline Within the AIF on the Western Front. And secondly, surely this is going to be the shortest presentation that will ever be, because everyone knows what it's about. So... For Peter, this is the, um, the, the title here. Uh, the discipline record of the Australian Imperial Force was the worst within the, uh, the, the, the British Army. So I think there's nothing there that we really um, would, um, would argue with. And this is a, a well uh, discussed subject. But um, what, we're, what, I'm, what I'm going to be doing is in addition to a lot of the um, the official history of the, war, the, of the First World War from the Australian perspective by Bean and other papers that have been done as well. I have added the service records of the 5th, 5th 22nd from the National Archives into this. And what this is able us to do is to, to put some personal perspectives onto the whole subject. So tonight's presentation, we're really going to be... Um, focusing on a number of um, key things here. First of all, we'll be looking at the factors which uh, resulted in the poor Australian discipline. And then from that, we're going to be looking at the discipline and the court martial comparison between the 5th, 22nd, the AIF, and also the, uh, the British Army as well, in, in numbers. So we can, we can actually do some numerical contrast. But at, really at the heart of this presentation, are the, um, the, the case studies from the, uh, from the court martial. So we're going to be looking at a number of these in, in a reasonable amount of data. Uh, and then finally, a quick look and comparing against the military discipline between the, uh, between the combatants and, also, and then asking ourselves, did the poor discipline negatively impact the fighting capability of the AIF? So let's uh, start with who are the 22nd Infantry Battalion? Well, they were formed in uh, March uh, 1915. So the AIF had already set sail for uh, Egypt and Gallipoli by this stage. And so they were um, formed into the, into the second division and formed part of the 6th Infantry Brigade. They arrived in Egypt in, uh, in June 1915. Um, and then France, they, uh, they left uh, uh, Egypt in, in March and arrived in Marseille on the 26th of March. And I've listed there the significant battle honours that um, where they were. But I think the easiest thing to, to really put into context with the 22nd is, is that they were the one of the last out of Gallipoli. They were on the firing line during the successful evacuation uh, in December 1915, and the 22nd were also first into the line in, uh, in France, one of the very first in, with the 6th Brigade, and they were also uh, involved in fighting on the last but one day in, in France as well. So you can really think of them as being at the, 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 the bookends of the whole time that the AIF was in the Western, on the Western Front. Now, I'm going to be looking at the fifth reinforcement. Um, the, the Australian infantry battalions were reinforced by packets of men throughout the war. And the, the 20, uh, 22nd were reinforced by a total of 20 reinforcements coming from um, mid-1915 through to about October 1917. So after that, even though there was another year of the war to go, the only ones that they had were general reinforcements. Now, why have I chosen the fifth reinforcements? Well, that is quite simple. Yeah, that's because my grandfather, as a 17-year-old lad, he, um, he enlisted into the, uh, into the fifth reinforcements and of, of the 22nd Infantry Battalion. 
So this schematic here, um, we what this actually shows is the the lifespan of the the, the 22nd when they were in um, on the Western Front. So the horizontal axis is time, as you can see, and then the vertical axis is zero to hundred percent. And the different colours shows what the men were actually doing. So the big purple at the bottom is showing that these are the men that were with the 22nd. And, and then the green is men that got transferred into another unit, ready de detention. Then we've got camp, hospital, return to Australia, discharge, and then sadly the gray at the top is killed. So you can see from this that the real, real big event that took place was at Poisier in July and August, 1916, when not just the 22nd, but a lot of the Australian uh, divisions suffered badly at that particular time. And so from that, that time, you can see the purple line, the, the, the fifth reinforcements never got back to more than about 30% of their number uh, that were, were active with the, with the unit. And, if, and, and I think just a general comment about this is it, what it indicates that there was a general um, sort of cycle between men that would be either wounded or they were in hospital that they would uh, then, did, uh, well, wounded first of all, or sick, would go to hospital. They would then either go back to join the unit or they would, um, they would have to be returned to Australia. So you can see as the time went on, there was this gradual attrition of the numbers of, of men that were available to be called upon. And so by the time we get to the end of the war, over one in four of the men had been killed and over half had been discharged by November 1918. And I think in, with reference to this particular um, uh, presentation here, you can see that the, the red line here, which marks detention, increases as we go through the war. And we'll be talking about that in more detail. So first of all, we're going to be looking at the factors which are resulting in poor Australian discipline. And the first thing really is to do with the character and personality of the man, which was defined by the environment which he was brought up with. And so uh, there's a lot of being said about this, about, you know, what it is to be Australian. And so, you know, you've got people that have come particularly from the old country, class riven society into a new area where that where class meant absolutely nothing. People were going out into the frontier. So there was very much a can-do attitude around the place. And one of the big differences between the Australians and other members of the, uh, the, B, the BEF were that all the way through, they were volunteers to a man. Now, although there was this can-do frontier attitude where there was the, you know, the, the, the belief that if you were working out either in the mines or around the outbush and that you would never leave your mate behind, um, not everyone was bought, brought up in these sort of outback environments. In fact, the, if you look at the 5th, 22nd, the vast, vast majority of them were brought up in Melbourne and the suburbs. Now, yes, a lot of them were doing manual type works like um, uh, laborers and um, you know, other, other manual type uh, pieces of work. But, um, but, but what they did is they effectively sort of adopted or inherited the creed or the ethos that it, what it was to be an Australian. And they carried this through to the, um, to the battlefields of the, uh, of the First World War, which was never to let your mate down. You would, put, you would lie your own, put your own life on the line uh, for your mate. And there was always this thing about the fear of being haunted in later of life of not being able to carry things, things through. So Charles Bean, who um, he went over to, uh, to Gallipoli, first of all, and then onto the Western Front as the official Australian war correspondent, and then, as we know, became the official historian. He said that the Australian, um, particularly the private, was quick to act on his own initiative. And as a result, others instinctively looked up to the Australian private as a leader, sometimes to good, sometimes to bad. And so we're going to be seeing some of this as we go through the presentation today. And when we're going to start, actually, we're going to go straight into one, which is uh, Private Reginald Charples. 
Um, this is, actually happened before the men got to the Western Front. So this was in, in Egypt. And his uh, private shaft was here. And at the bottom, you can see there's this image of this train, uh, which, is, which is heading through the deserts of Egypt. In fact, the 22nd Battalion are on this very train, but this was taken in March 1916 as they were moving north uh, up towards Alexandria. Now, on this particular day, on the 7th of January, which is the day before the, the fifth reinforcements got taken, into, or taken on strength into the battalion, there was some sort of incident on board the train. Um, Sharples acted on his own initiative, thought, right, we need to bring the train to a halt, leant over the back, pulled the pin out so that the train would actually uh, decouple, believing that the hydraulic pipe would break and all the brakes would come off. But that didn't happen because it wasn't, it didn't have hydraulics on there. So eventually the, uh, the, the uncoupled uh, part of the train came to a halt, but, uh, but, but because what he did, it was extremely dangerous, foolish, some would say, he had a field general court martial, uh, which was held in the, in the desert. And he was, uh, he was uh, sentenced to 12 months imprisonment with hard labor. And he was sent back to, to Australia. Now, when, when he actually um, finished that sentence, so in January, 1917, he actually wrote a letter to, um, uh, to, to, to re-enlist. And here's the letter that's up then. I'll just read a slight part of it here. It says, my discharge brands me as a bad character being actually a life sentence, which the court martial did not include, include, as I was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment only. I hope, sir, that you will have my discharge cancelled and give me an opportunity for faith to faithfully serve my king and country and earn for myself a clean and honourable discharge. So you can see here that even though he felt that he was doing the right thing, he had gone back, he had served his time, but he had this cloud hanging over him for the rest of his life. So this uh, request was approved. He went back to the front, he served there and he was wounded um, in to towards the end of the fighting in September, 1918. What I hadn't mentioned was one of his other reasons for going back that he had two brothers that was also serving within the 22nd that enlisted with him in the fifth reinforcements. Uh, Private John Sharples, unfortunately, was killed in action in April, and his other, but his other brother, uh, Robert, who was wounded twice, uh, came home with him as well. The second thing is we're looking at is the, is, the, is the choice of punishments that were used as laid out in the Army Act. And um, as you probably know, you know, a charged man would face some sort of trial, the very serious ones had a, had a, a court-martial, the moderate ones could either have a district court-martial or they could be tried by their officers and NCOs of the, of, the main, of the man's own unit. And within the British Army, there are a whole range of different um, penalties going down. Uh, starting at the top was the death penalty for the most serious uh, crimes, either military, such as desertion, cowardice, etc., or if it was uh, to do with murder. And then coming down from that, you had various forms of incarceration, confinement to camp, field punishment number one, which was the uh, shackling of, of a man to a fixed object, often like a gun carriage or something like that. This took the place of flogging from years ago. Um, so field punishment number one was there, field punishment number two, which was the shackling of an individual, but out of sight of the, uh, the, the, his, um, his fellow men, and other things like reduction in rank and fine. But what happened in, uh, in 1903, and this follows on from an incident that happened in 1902 down in South Africa in the Boer War, and that was uh, uh, two Australian um, uh, officers, Hancock, and here we have uh, Breaker Morant, they were convicted of war crimes uh, down there of, of killing prisoners of war. And what happened was, was that they were court-martialed by, by British court-martial and they were killed. Now, the, the Australian government at that time, they did not, they, you know, they, they uh, were, were upset about the way that they thought that their men 
would be treated by an, another country. So they introduced this uh, defense act here, which, which basically meant that um, men in the Australian army could only be court-martialed for certain things such as mutiny um, so, or, or murder, uh, but also that the British could not actually do the court-martials themselves. So they, they took, um, took control of this. And as time went on, even though Australians had been given the death penalty, none of them were, were carried through because they felt that being a volunteer army, that it would have a much more damaging impact on the rest of the men there and also the amount of reinforcements that would be coming through um, as, as the year went on. So basically, the death penalty did not um, was not there. But in in Egypt in 1915, it was it was clear that there were problems taking place, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, um, later. And here we have a picture of uh, William uh, G uh, Major General William Throsby Bridges, who himself was uh, was tasked by the British to set up a Sandhurst equivalent in uh, at Duntroon. He was the leader of the Australians into Gallipoli. Um, he actually um, was killed in action. Well, in fact, he was shot and, and mortally wounded. Um, but prior to that, he could see that the, there was all this trouble taking place in Australia. And he decided, OK, we're going to make an example of these, these people and send them home which to the Australians was a really bad thing to do because that was all to do with dishonour, similar in the way we, we saw with Sharples. So he got Charles Bean to write a letter to explain why 131 people from, um, uh, from his army were being sent home. And uh, it went down quite badly uh, for, for Bean. Bean was seen as someone that was collaborating with the, with the officers and that against the, against the common man. Uh, but it, but it, it, it remained the most um, uh, feared uh, piece of um, sort of punishment for the Australian up until Poisier in 1916. And the reason because of that, if you go back to that chart and you saw all those casualties that were, were happening in Poisier, there was a lot of people, a lot of men that thought, hold on, you know, I've, I've, I've had two tours of Poisier there I've seen 10% of the men go back through shell shock, um, many killed, many wounded in that. If I go and say desert and go to the back, what's the worst going to happen to me? I'll be sent home. I th well, maybe that's not such a bad thing to do. So the Australians realised that actually this was going to serve no purpose going forward, so it, that they got rid of it. So what that meant in the end was if you take away really the, um, the death penalty, field punishment number one was not being used because of the, it, it was shown to be humiliating to, to, to the soldiers, and we didn't have return people to the, um, back to Australia, then the worst that could really happen was some form of uh, incarceration. And so men would be going back to places like, this is a picture of Lewis uh, prison, down in, down in Sussex. So here, we, what we can do is, is sort of have a look to see if there was an impact of the death penalty on the court martial and rates of absent, absenteeism. So this bottom chart sh here shows that uh, the number of death penalties that were issued by the different countries there, and you can see that uh, the executions that took place. And Australia was unique in this case that even though 113, 113 men were charged and, and given a death sentence, none of them were actually carried through. through. And, the, and the soldiers pretty much knew that that was going to be the case. So if we look how that transfers into the number of court martials that took place, about one in 33 men in the British part of the army faced a court-martial during the war. Uh, for the Canadians, it was slightly less, one in 25, the New Zealand's one in 50, but for the Australians, you can see here, is one in 14. So twice as many people, men in the, from the Australian army were being court-martialed in Britain than the British. 
And then if we look at the fifth 22nd, we have a whopping great one in seven of the men faced a court martial there. So you can see that, it, that my grandfather's group, uh, they, they were a, you know, a very good case group, study group to use here. And then, so we can see what the impact was having here on absenteeism. And this is just a snapshot taken in July, 1918. An order of magnitude more Australians were going absent than the British army. And uh, uh, you know, the, same, the same with the uh, New Zealanders and Canadians. And as we didn't have the death penalty in place and we weren't using much of field punishment number one, you can see that imprisonment became the main tool that, for, for use here. And so there were more absenteeisms in court martials in, in the AEF than, than the British Army here. So that what we've got here in, in these, in fact, we've got three, three columns. Um, these are the absol absolute numbers here on, on the left hand side. So the 30 court martials from the 22 men in the 5th, 22nd. And if you can, if you look here, 73% of these were for some sort of absenteeism, compared with 58% in the AIF. And here we have it in the, uh, the British Army. So it's 44%. So still the lion's share, but you can see it was considerably more within the AIF and particularly within the fifth uh, reinforcements. And within the fifth reinforcements, 44, th these are just the court martials. Many men went absent without leave as well and just got some sort of fine. And 44 men went to AWOL, that's one in four on a total of a hundred occasions through, uh, through, the, through the war. And then if we look at what was happening on the desertion side of the, uh, the equation here, so a lot more serious because a lot of the AWOLs were happening away from the front. So these were men that were back home, or sorry, back in the, uh, the, the command depots back in the UK or in France and that, so less serious. But what was more serious were the desertions that were taking place here. And you can see that in the first half of 1917, that the British Army, excluding the AIF and also the, uh, the New Zealand, were roughly running at about eight or nine desertions per division in that time, whereas the Australians were running at 34, so a massive amount more. Now, this was ca causing a problem, and right from the word go, the, the British High Command, so Haig and Rawlingson as well, uh, who was looking after the, uh, where the Australians were during the time of uh, the, the, the Somme 1916, were wanting the Australians to actually make some examples of these people that would, the, were persistently all the bad desertions. And this even came through to the senior um, Australian command as well. So, you know, for example, General Birdwood, who led the men as, as, um, ashore at uh, Anzac Cove. You had Holmes, who, who ran um, one of the divisions, and uh, Glasgow, one of the brigade uh, uh, generals. They were starting to advocate that maybe it is time to make use of the ultimate deterrent in order to stop this um, happening. So if we look at the custodial sentences, uh, what actually happened to, to the men once they were charged, um, the, the top three are some sort of custodial. So penal, penal servitude, detention, imprisonment with hard labor. Here are the absolute numbers in the fifth uh, 22nd, which comes to a total of 73% versus the 34% that was taking place in the British Army. So again, this shows that the men were going in, into prison. And then also this shows that the, with the use of field punishment number one, only one man or one case out of the 30 received field punishment number, number one versus almost you know, well, between one in five and one in four in the, in the British Army. So, so it, you know, this you know, shows that, that, you know, how people were being charged or the sentences that they would get. 
The third area is the, the rates of pay. Now, the Australians were known as the six bob tourists, as most of you would know. They were paid five shillings a day uh, in their pocket, plus a shilling uh, a day, which is deferred. And then they could, uh, they could select how much went back to Australia or not. But with this extra money, it meant that more men were now willing to go absent without leave and accept the fine. And in Bean writes that uh, it was Lef Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Gellibrand or Jellybrand at that particular time, who was the commanding officer of the 12th Battalion. He later went on to be very successful with the, uh, with the 6th Brigade and was instrumental in the 6th Brigade's success at Bulkor in um, his second Bulkor in May 1917. He would have a man in front of him and then say, he said, right, soldier, did you, did you have a good time? Yes, sir, they would reply. Was it worth it? Yes, sir. Then you'll be happy to accept the fine. Yes, sir. There you go. Slap the fine and off you go. So there was a sort of a degree of sort of acceptance that men, if they went away for a couple of days, overstayed leave and absent without leave, that they would, they would uh, come back and be fined. So there was more money for not just paying for fines, but also more money for alcohol and drunkenness. And as you can see from what we have below, the Rising Sun badge was a target for what I've commonly called exploiters here. So we have um, uh, in, in the vertical here, the percentage of men with an STD, sexually transmitted disease within the First World War. And you can see about 5% five, five of British soldiers uh, contracted an STD, but, uh, but amongst the Dominion troops, it was a lot higher. Now, part of us could well be the fact that they were away from home, they weren't going back to their families and um, home depots, etc. But I know that, uh, that, that the Canadians were on a similar sort of rate of pay as the AIF, but they certainly had more disposable income to play, to spend on extracurricular activities. Um, I haven't been able to actually uh, verify what the rate of play of the New Zealander was. So if there's anyone that's watching that can actually message later about what that is, just to see if, if they are in that, that same sort of bracket. Then the fourth area is around battle fatigue and strain. Uh, and this was taken in place in 1918. Now, this is not, I wouldn't say this is unique to the Australians. However, in 1918, the Australian divisions and the Corps towards the end was continually in the front line from March through to October 1918. So this was right at the, the time of the German Spring Offensive and then preparing for and then going through the 100 day offensive. And there was an impression that was growing that Australian troops were often being asked to do more than their fair share of the difficult fighting and often picking up work, unfinished work from others. And when I say others, that invariably meant a British unit or you know, a division that was, that was on their flank. So there was this sentiment that was, uh, that was coming up. Now, this is, this is quite a, you know, a well-known photograph here taken of an Australian platoon in August, 1918. And this is, this is, a, this is the whole platoon. And so the, some battalions were going into fights, as it say here, with 150 men. This is the equivalent of three fully manned um, uh, platoons, but there was, should be 16 platoons within a battalion. So they were very, very heavily under man going through. And towards the end of August, Major General Hobbs, who was the commander of the uh, fifth division, he, he wrote to, to, to the Corps Commander at the time, uh, Monash, saying that the, his division was approaching the limits of its endurance. And that was seen on the 14th of September, a couple of weeks later, that there was the first, I've actually got mutiny, it's been caused it a mutiny, but the men effectively were told that they were being relieved, but in the process of their being withdrawn from the line, they were halted and told that they had to go back and they had to follow the retreating army. And basically they refused. In the end, they did go through, but the point had actually been made that, hold on, you know, you know we, we're getting towards the end of our limit. 
The strain on the second and third divisions was also becoming, uh, you know, very, very strong. And the, when the second division attacked at Mont Saint Quentin, where their memorial is, where you saw that photograph, uh, that picture be before, men were, were running up the hill screaming like banshees in order to try to make them sound big more than they actually were. And, uh, and during, during that time, that actual attack, there were eight VCs awarded. Uh, around Perón, which was the most uh, any one particular engagement in, um, by the Australians in the war. We also saw, which was what was probably the most um, uh, sort of significant uh, act of uh, desertion, which took place in, in, in September 1918 by a company of the 1st Battalion. They had just lost all their officers and they started to walk to the, to the rear leaving the other company that they was going to attack in to, um, to fight it on their own with, I think only something like uh, a handful of officers and 84 men. So these 190, 119 men were all court-martialed and I believe all but one of them were, um, uh, were found guilty of that. So that was probably you know, the most, uh, significant uh, um, episode and also you know, shows the uh, battle uh, fatigue. But also what was happening was with the reduction in size of the, the, the fighting strengths, a number of the battalions were, were getting below critical point. So, uh, so, um, so Monash decided that he was actually going to disband a number of the battalions here and all but the 60th refused uh, the 60th agreed mainly because of the, the weight of um, power that uh, Brigadier um, Pompey Elliott had over his, his 15th Brigade there. But it wasn't the case that we, you know, we were refusing to fighting. In fact, what the 25th said, they said, right, next time there is a stunt, give us the hardest job. Because what will happen is, is we'll go over, we'll do it, if we're successful, we can prove that we're still worthy as the 25th and should not be disbanded. Otherwise, the German machine gunner and the German artillery man would do your disbanding for you. So that was the sort of sentiment that was still there, which is this esprit de corps that the men had. But if we look at trying to, to, to quantify and look at the, the effect of strain on uh, the men through numbers, if you look at the right-hand columns, these are the number of court-martials in the AIF in 17 and 18, and this represents the number of, uh, of men, or, you know, percentage, six, seven percent. So not much difference here. But if you look at our cohort, which is the fifth, 22nd that have gone through altogether, what you can see here is that there was a marked jump between, in, in, in 1918 of the men that are going, that are committing crimes and being court-martialed. So I think this is showing that the degree of strain that was going through after a couple of years fighting was now starting to show in the, in the discipline. And this can also now be seen in the rates of desertions, the desertion convictions that were taking place. And the other metric, coming back to our good old STDs, um, the, the rates that of STD, STD rates per 100 men in all the British armies, you could see was higher in 1918 than 1917. Uh, this is, is, is in the UK and, and typically there were more cases back in the UK than there were in France, but you can see the jump there. And this is the fifth 22nd comparison. And these are the actual numbers of the, uh, the fifth 22nd. So again, you can see a trend here of increasing numbers of uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease as time went on, which is an indication of uh, discipline starting to, to erode. So I think in summary here, discipline was thus an ever-present problem in the, in the AIF. But as, as Bean says, the, a volunteer army will contain a vast ar array of characters and I guess none more so than this gentleman here that I think uh, most of you will recognize as, uh, as uh, uh, John Barney Hines. And he was, he was known as the Souvenir King. And I think you could probably tell why he is a kleptomaniac. 
but uh, I mean, he, he was a, a he was English born to German immigrants that got married in England, had two children, decided to leave. He went to New Zealand for about a decade, where he developed quite a extensive uh, criminal record there, but then decided to go to to Australia and sign up for the AIF after the British Army had uh, rejected, after the Royal Navy had rejected him as well in his earlier life, the AIF welcomed him in with, with open arms. And so Heinz, to his battalion commanders, and it's the 40, he was in the 45th Battalion, which I believe was the same uh, battalion that uh, Private Lynch was in, that was talked about in the, uh, the Somme Mud book, um, he was seen as a tower of strength for the for the men within the front line, but behind the line, then as one other officer said, he was he wasn't a pain in the neck. He was two pains in the neck, and through the war, he was responsible for no less than nine court martials. But you know, he he did a job in in the army, so you could see that even with these court martials and his discipline. The, 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 Austra the, the way that the Australians were set up, they were still releasing people to put them back into the, into the fighting line, particularly later on as the, as the numbers started to, uh, to, to deplete, de deplete. So, you know, going back to 1915 and 1916, being observed that a small group of criminals had enlisted um, he said often older and born overseas, but looking at the numbers in the 5th, 22nd, I see no difference. Uh, the, 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 the average age of someone court-martialed was exactly the same as the, the people that weren't court-martialed in the, in, the, in the 5th, 22nd, and the same whether they were born overseas or not. Maybe, maybe later on, you know, uh, people like Heinz or men like he Heinz, um, someone they had in mind. But he could see uh, heavy drinking, there was absent without leave, fighting with locals, there was the infamous Wasser riots that took place in a red light uh, area of, uh, of Cairo, um, where in excess of 2,000 Anzac troops um, rioted in the red light district there. And this was this is just before they found out that they were going to, going to Gallipoli within a couple of weeks, but uh, it was kind of glossed over a lot of the time there. But because there were problems that were taking place in, uh, in, in Egypt, it was, uh, it was decided when, when the men came back from Gallipoli that they would move their camp from just outside Cairo here and down by the, by the pyramids to a place called Tel El Kabir, which strategically was a lot better, close to the Suez Canal running down through here, where they expected the Turks to be attacking at any time across from the east. But of course, it meant that they were further away from, um, from you know, from the, uh, the, the red lights and the uh, temptations of, of Cairo. Um, also, what happened in February, March 1916 was a big reorganization. You had more men coming in, the formation of the 4th and 5th Divisions, but they also started to create um, specialist units, such as the Pioneers, such as the Machine Gun Corps as well. And some, um, some of the uh, commanding officers of the battalions were already in Egypt. They used this as an opportunity to offload some of their men to some of these unsuspecting new units. And we might be able to see some of this later. Now, the, the whole um, sort of um, indiscipline that was happening down in Egypt uh, was, having, was, was ringing alarm bells to the British back home. And they were worried that their impact when they came up to the Western Front would have a negative impact on particularly the Canadians here. So Lieutenant General Birdwood, who, as I said, he, he, he led the men in uh, into Anzac. He wrote to all men, reminding them of their responsibilities and, you know, and do not leave, do not lose the great reputation that has been hard won and paid with, you know, with sweat and blood. On, on, the, on the beaches and the cliff tops of Anzac. Don't lose this just because of discipline. So when they, um, they left Egypt to go to France, plans were put in place that as they arrived through Marseille, that all the disembarkation of the ships would happen at night onto the trains and then off so that there'll be less uh, temptation to, to go into town. 
And by the time that the second division, first of all, then the first and then the fifth had gone through, uh, the, 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 uh, the French authorities said that no troops had behaved better than the Australians had gone, gone through. So they were, you know, on their best behaviours, they went through that. And then in 1916 to 1919, so on the Western Front, um, the, as, we, as we've seen, the Australian cases were, which were brought before court-martial were proportionally much higher than, than the British. There were the two parts of it, the, what they called the larrikin behaviour, so the slovenly, you know, dress, the uh, non-saluting of officers. This was an irritant to the British uh, officers. In fact, of course, the Australians were winding up a lot of the British because of this. But it was more to do with the increasing numbers of absent without leave and desertion that was taking place as well. So this was a wor worry and behaviour, as you, as you saw here, deteriorated in 1917, particularly in the command depots. We talked about the fact that the pressure was being put now back onto the Australian government to try to make examples of some of the bad, bad, bad uh, cases of desertion and that but the Australian government, they held firm in their belief on, on this. Um, on the flip side of that is we talked about field punishment number one. When the, when the 12th Brigade decided to actually put um, uh, field punishment number one into more use, they did see a decrease in the amount of um, uh, crime. So, so that one did work. Um, we've seen also 1918, um, uh, the battle fatigue that was taking place. And then right at the end of the war, uh, the men that were coming out from France and Belgium back to, to uh, the UK, down to Southern England, waiting to go home, it took a while to get them back. So the, uh, the whole discipline started to, uh, to break down in the camps in, in the UK as well. So what we're gonna look at now is changed tack and we're going to, to start to look at the, um, the men that actually went absent without leave and um, some desertions within the within the 5th 22nd. So first of all I wanted to try to start off to see if was there any difference between the character of a man that was court-martialed within a group and those that weren't court-martialed. So on, our, on the left hand side here we have the court-martialed men in the 5th 22nd and this is the whole of their cohort all 154 men so if we look if i think if we concentrate on the percentages here so you can see the casualties are pretty similar 68 percent so over two-thirds of men within the court martial group would become a casualty so either killed in action or or wounded uh, and that compares with you know one in four slightly more in the um, in, in, in the whole group in the whole of the fifth 22nd but when you add in that the fact that a number of the men would be wounded on more than one occasion then the this group had 22 woundings in total which it, for the 22 men men is exactly one an average of one per person and then if you look over here it is 1.03 so pretty much identical the chances or becoming a casualty were if you were court-martialed or not. Then if you think about things like awards, were the people that were being court-martialed the ones that were, were cowards and they were running away and they didn't want to do anything? Well, you can see here that 14% were uh, uh, received a uh, military award versus 13% overall. So again, no difference. And the promotions is just slightly different. Um, you, you know, if you just added another per another man here that would be promoted, then it would be exactly the same. And then also, if you look at the amount of time that the men were with the unit, it made no difference at all. So the, on average, a man of, of the 5th 22nd was with the unit. So that's, that's either in uh, France or Belgium, 45% of the time, and it's and it's ex pretty much exactly the same as it was for um, for those that were court-martialed. So I think you can see that you, you, we can't really distinguish between between the character or find some sort of character differentiation between court-martialed and non-court-martialed. 
But now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these cases in more details. And the first three I have put up here are the most serious ones. These are the ones that where the, the desertions took place. And so because of this, um, what I have done is I've actually kept these men anonymous because ours is not to retrospectively judge why these men did, did this. And I do, you know, I do not want to, you know, to, to you know, prejudge or say things that which, which may, with, you know, without being there. But, but I think this is an example here to show that, uh, you know, what was going, going on with those people that were the most persistent offenders. And I think we, we're starting here, the first thing is you can see they were all young men, 22, 21, 18. And then if you look at Private A here, he only spent 8% of his time with the, with the unit. And uh, he was sick on a number of occasions, uh, absent without leave three times without, uh, without being a court martial. Uh, he went, he went uh, AWOL in April 17, but the most serious one, this was all happening when he was back in England. So, so he eventually made it over to, uh, uh, to Belgium at that time toward the, I think it was round about um, uh, sort of September or, or just before that, sort of the, in, the, um, in the August time of 1917. And here we have on the 19th of September, 1917, he, he deserted. He got a um, field general court martial so he, he deserted to the uh, to, to the rear. What it says in his records that um, he, he at first he he presented himself as being wounded, but he, in fact he wasn't. Now the 19th of September, the men were on the uh, the front line at uh, on the West Hoyt Ridge, and the day before that, um, nine members, nine colleagues of uh, C Company were all. Uh, sheltering in a captured uh, German blockhouse, which uh, took a direct hit on uh, from a high explosive shell, and all nine were killed instantaneously in, in there, and they are all buried together, close together in in Hoog Cemetery. So you know this was going on. Maybe that was the thing that flipped it, flipped him. He was probably one of these people that did thought, oh, okay, I didn't really want to be in the army in the first place. Remember, he's a volunteer. You know, given the fact that he probably spent the spent most of the time out um, in, in England. Anyway, he was uh, the, the sentence uh, towards the end of the year, he was let out of, of, of prison. But even after the fighting had stopped, he wanted to get away. And um, he went absent without leave uh, in Belgium. And, and, the, and he was caught wearing the cap and a great coat of a, of a Belgian soldier. So he's trying to escape. Now, privates B and C, what you don't see from this, that in fact, these are uh, sequential um, service numbers. So these two guys would have been mates right from the word go. And you can see that both of them were wounded in action in uh, Poisier in 1916. And they both had very similar sort of uh, discipline uh, records here, going absent without leave, drunk, overstaying leave in the U UK. Um, but it was it was not until June of uh, 1918 when things were serious, and at this time the 22nd were on the Morland Corps Ridge. Um, they were supporting an attack that was taking place by another brigade on the right hand side. The 22nd were doing a bit of a diversionary attack, and it was led by a Lieutenant Harricks, and it was one of the most successful raids that took place during this time. They went, went over and uh, they didn't suffer a single casualty and they kept, then they reported 30 of the enemy killed uh, when they came back. So Harrix was awarded the military cross. There's about four other men that were awarded as well. But, uh, but this was sort of environment that the men were living at the time where you know, these raids were taking place. And I think by this, you know, that they probably felt as though they had done their bit, had been being uh, wounded. So... You can see here they had five years penal servitude for something quite serious, but both of them were suspended. Again, I guess it was believed because numbers were running down and they needed men back onto the front line. But only a month later, uh, they were down uh, towards Villas Bretonneau. Um, they were in the reserve line at that particular time and both of them deserted. This time, 
um, uh, private B got 15 years penal servitude, servitude, whereas private C got life, and it was commuted to to five uh, to five years. Now, I think what I not think I've um, I haven't mentioned this as well, but when we're talking about trying to make um, examples. There was uh, Major Godley, who was, he was commanding officer of the, of the New Zealanders at Gallipoli. He went on to become the commanding officer of the second Anzac Corps. Um, so he, at that time, he had the third division coming in of, uh, alongside the New Zealanders. He could see what was happening within the Australian um, um, uh, divisions, and he advocated, look, Okay, I understand about not using the death penalty, but if you, why not mean that if you take, if you've got a penal servitude, if you're going in prison, that it's there to stay and it will, you'll be serving it after the war as well. But, uh, but that, that didn't happen. We're going to look at uh, quickly at uh, Harold Smith. He was another uh, persistent offender, but. Um, but I think he probably represents more of the typical Australian sort of play hard, work hard uh, ethic there. Age 19, again, very young and a hairdresser. So not, not exactly your crocodile Dundee sort of stereotype of, uh, of, of a Bushman, hard, hard Australian soldier. But anyway, he saw, um, he, he saw action through, throughout the war. He was wounded on three occasions. Um, up in, uh, in the uh, nursery district or the nursery area up near Armentier, back at Dornancourt during the German Spring Offensive, and then later at Morlancourt, which is that time I was talking about in the last one, when he got gassed. Uh, but, and his military discipline primarily was, was when he was back in England. And so he had district court martial on two occasions. And then when he was, uh, when he was recovering, from, uh, from his, his, his gunshot wound to the forehead, and he was working his way back through the, uh, the uh, AIF depot in Le Havre, he got drunk, he was uh, given a field general court martial and awarded 28 days field punishment number one. And this is the only example of field punishment number one we have with the 5th 22nd. And the reason why I think that was the case is because it happened at depot. And so they were probably going to be a little bit more stricter on what they were going to be doing. And also the fact that he, there was there were hardly any members of his unit there for, for him to be seen in front of. So, you know, the, so anyway, this was the only fuel punishment number one that, uh, that came up. And because, you know, he was, he was a you know, good fighting man, um, well thought of, he, he was promoted to Lance Corporal in at the end of October 1917, which was the uh, the end of the brute signed a pole capital uh, in, in 3rd Ypres. And we're quick, going to quickly go through some of the others. We got at the top, um, we got Private Hoskin, who has the unfortunate distinction of not only being the first of the 5th 22nd to be court martialed in, um, in, in Europe, but he was also killed in action. Um, he was the first one to be killed in action of the 5th, 22nd in the whole of the war. He was killed by the same shell as his mate, 2339, uh, Private Hogan. Um, so, you know, so, so that's a Private uh, Hoskin, and he's, um, he's um, buried in the uh, at Russian farm. Um, Private Kerr, these, these are all in sequential order, by the way, um, decreasing. If you look here, May 1916, so they weren't in the front at this stage, disobeying command of a superior officer. He was given five years penal servitude for this, which I think is, seems to be quite, quite harsh for, for this. Uh, he was let out um, and he went back and he, and he was wounded in action in May 1918. Wakely and Hayes, you can see missed embarkation. They were two of five men that missed the boat the Osterley, when they left from, um, from Melbourne in 19, 1915, put into Fremantle. Five of them uh, didn't come back on board and they had to catch uh, other transports late, later on. And we got Private Stevens here, but the, the people that are paying attention would notice that that's a Stevens with a V and not a PH. So that is not my grandfather there. Um, Another anonymous one, Private D, the reason why I've made him anonymous here, even though he's just had one 
court martial is if, if you look here, he went absent without leave on eight occasions. He also contracted an STD on four occasions. So if you look at his record, there was this cycle of, of going absent without leave, um, getting an STD, going into hospital, getting cured, and then maybe sometimes coming back to camp or even jumping from hospital to do the same thing again. So, you know, it, 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 it seems as though this individual was using a certain methodology, um, which a lot of British high command saw, saw this akin to self-harming and should be treated a lot more seriously. Um, you know, he was using this way to, to keep out from the, uh, from the front. Um, at the bottom, we got uh, Private Smiley, and I think this is probably the, 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 you know, the most the saddest case or the, the most unfortunate one here. If you look here, P Private Smiley, he was with the unit 78% of the time. So if you look at his record, what it does, it just says, uh, arrive, um, uh, uh, left, left Egypt, arrive Marseille, and then there was an entry saying, went on leave. And then the next thing you have is the fact that uh, he had been court-martialed. So there was nothing in there the rest of the time, which shows that he was with the unit. So, so he went through the whole of Poitiers. He was there with the horrible mud at Fleurs. He was there at Bourcourt. He was there at Third Ypres as well. So he had gone through the whole thing. And then he was... Uh, he was dis uh, he just disobeyed an order i don't know what that order was and from that he was given 12 months imprisonment with hard labor but so uh, you know you could have think well if, if there's a person that's done his bit then that's probably smiley but um you know i think the sad thing is is that he gets this sentence in may 1918 but he is released and he goes back to the front back to the moreland court area again where he is gassed and sadly five days later he he dies of his wounds so um, this is this is um, a private smiley uh, his resting place at the San Rica uh, British Cemetery um, in, in France and what we're going to do now we're going to yes uh, private Carmody uh, again one of the chaps that missed the embarkation twice uh, I don't know if this is an example of someone being transferred to another unit, having having already displayed some um, in, in discipline. Uh, Private uh, Private Roberts here. So he has the he has the holy the holy trinity not the holy trinity but the the, the, the three um, main items of World War One, which is shell shock, gas, and trench feet. So he he actually he, he got the full. World War I experience uh, did Private uh, uh, Roberts. Uh, he he was, uh, uh, had a court martial in November 19, uh, 1918 for going absent without leave. Private Samways, there's a picture of him. Um, he was wounded in action in uh, at, at Poitiers and he went absent without leave on a number of occasions. And you can see here, Field General Court Martial, November 1918. And I will be returning to Private Sunways shortly. And then last but not least on this lot, we have Corporal Clack, who was 100% with the unit, but at age 44, he, he was attached to uh, General Birdwood's um, HQ. And in February 1919, he was charged with drunkenness and charged the princely sum of one pound. So now we're going to look at three of uh, three of the other character here, characters here. Um, the first one is uh, John or Jack McFarland. He's uh, age 19 from um, Port Melbourne. He suffered from sickness early on, so he didn't actually make it to the 22nd Battalion until, uh, until 1917. But when he arrived, he was a very, very popular person, member of the battalion, because he, he became captain of the 22nd Battalion football team. He was a boxing champion. He won swimming races and he also won athletics races. So, you know, a real good, solid uh, sportsman, like, you know, very much the caricature that we'd think of, of, of an Australian. And he was actually awarded the Distinguished Conduct Model 
during the, uh, the campaign uh, in, in 3rd Ypres uh, for his actions as a runner, both uh, on the 4th of um, October at Broodsinder and on the 9th at uh, Polkapel, where on one occasion um, he actually volunteered to go forward to try to find a part, a section which had become lost and, and separated from the, from the main group. And he managed to, to, to bring, the, bring them back. So for this, he, he got his military uh, uh, medal, sorry, distinguished conduct medal. Uh, and from following on this, he, he was promoted to uh, Lance, Lance Corporal, but on his own request in February, he wanted to go back, uh, just become a you know, regular private. But, um, but, uh, but Jack, he was, he, he ran foul, fell, foul, fall, fall, <laughs> he had in discipline records as well. And uh, as you can see here, they, they started when he was in Egypt and then also when we went to, when, when he went to, to England. And then when he was, he was on, on leave or when he was back in Le Havre, he was in a bar and he was getting, getting a little drunk. The barman refused to sell him any more. He, he, he said, no, you know, you know, give me some beer. There were other Australians in there. In there and an officer came up and said, come on, mate, you need to go now. McFarlane didn't take too calmly from that, turned around and, and, uh, and, he, and he hit him. So hitting an officer is not exactly a best move. And so he had the field general court martial to which he received three years penal servitude and also the forfeiture of his uh, DCM. But because he was popular amongst the whole of the battalion, including the officers, they wrote a letter and uh, saying that uh, whether he can have his D DCM reinstated and it was. Uh, but anyway, when he was in, in prison, he attempted escape and he injured a knee and an ankle falling from the top of the fence. And, and, and also, right at the very end of the war, he was the last of the Australians in the 5th 22nd to return because he did not embark to return to Australia and he was declared uh, an illegal um, absentee. Um, now, when... When Jack got back to uh, to Australia, he was in. He lived in Port Melbourne. He was uh, an active member of the Port M Melbourne uh, Football Club, and um, he, he he remained a member for the rest of his life. And to this very day, there is a, a medal called the best, the club's best and fairest, and it's known as the Jack McFarland Medal in honour of uh, John Jack. So here we go. So this is to to my grandfather George uh, Stevens, age seventeen, when when he enlisted, uh, just just weeks after hearing that his uncle uh, William Pinkerton had been killed at, um, at, at Anzac. He did service in the west on the Western Front. Uh, he was wounded in action at Fleur, and and then at uh, Lasar. Um, where he was, he was only back with the unit for two days before he had another, he had another blighty. So here's George here. Uh, but when he got back to uh, back to England, this is where his indiscipline um, started. Particularly when he teamed up with his old mate Charles Samways that I spoke about beforehand. So in August uh, 1917, both Private Samways and Private Stevens went um, absent without leave for six weeks and they were declared um, illegal absentees. Now we pieced this together since, um, because my, grand my grandfather never spoke about this, but what we found out that his grandfather owned a hotel in, uh, in Ealing called uh, the uh, Feathers Hotel. And it just so happened that Charles Sandway's here he was English born and he was born in England. So he would have said to George, come on, let's, let's go and see if we can track down your family and see if we can find his hotel stroke pub. Now this, uh, this had, uh, uh, his grandfather had, had long since died, but he had two sons, Edwin and, Fr and Fred, that were both um, hoteliers too. And, he, and they were owning this um, hotel here called the Drayton Court in Ealing. And in 1914, 
in their staff working down in the kitchens, they had a certain Vietnamese pastry chef and uh, dishwasher. And I always ask people if we're in, you know, face to face, name me one famous Vietnamese people. And people look at me at blank. <laughs> of course, there is only one. And it's uh, Ho Chi Minh. So Ho Chi Minh was there. So I, I think I can say that my family has had a part in developing one of the world's uh, leading revolutionaries in, in, in history here. But it was not just the hotel. Um, Edwin also um, uh, set up the Lyric Theatre, which was in Ealing. So, and there was a, uh, a gentleman's club for uh, like smoking rooms, snooker reading rooms as well. So there was a lot of sort of entertainment that was taking place, but not just in Ealing. And so if you see this photograph here, you should also be able to read what it says on the top. This is the, the world famous Eel Pie Island Hotel in Twickenham, which of course, I think probably as a few people on this call today that may well have been there in its heyday in the sixties when the Stones and the Who were all playing there. But Edwin owned this hotel during the First World War. And at that time, it was a center for tea dances. So um, my grandmother was living just down the road. And I think this is where the two of them met. So he, ha he had reasons to, you know, to go there. So, so anyway, they were declared that they, they were actually arrested um, uh, back in uh, after six weeks. But instead of having the book thrown at them for being away from six weeks, the, the first division had already changed their, their guidelines from one week to three weeks for court martials. This was six weeks. They had nothing. They had nothing. All they did was going straight back to the, uh, to the uh, overseas training brigade where they, um, where, where they uh, toughened up back to the front and they went back where grand, my grandfather, George, was wounded at Dernancourt. He was gassed as well at Moulincourt. And then eventually on the last action of the 22nd Battalion in, in the war, he was awarded the military medal for uh, volunteering as a stretcher bearer going forward to, to bring back the, uh, the, the, the wounded. But his indiscretions didn't end there. And he went to field general head of, he went absent without leave again with uh, Charles Sandways on the 11th of November, which I think you could imagine there was one or two parties that were taking place there. Um, and I think the reason why is that he had this in mind. Um, he had met the, uh, the lady of his dreams, uh, Minnie Taylor, and this is where they got married here at St. Stephen's Church in East Twickenham. Now, I don't have a picture of their wedding day, but I do have a picture of my Auntie um, Betty's wedding day. And this is my grandparents here with yours truly uh, sitting <laughs> in the middle. Yeah. So the last one I want to have a look at out of our uh, 5th 22nd is, is Private Oswald uh, Hunt, uh, another 21 year old here, uh, wounded in action at uh, Broodsinder, he, the military discipline, not too, not too much here, but he went uh, AWOL from in, in, in England and, and he actually <laughs> thought, you know, maybe I've had enough here. I've just been wounded in, in, up, in, uh, up in the Passchendaele battles here. So he, he went uh, uh, walkabout and he, um, he was away for, uh, he was arrested some months later in Manchester. He was given a, a district court martial uh, with four months detention. But he was, was let back right towards the end of the war. And with this map here, you can see uh, that uh, this is where we're moving up towards uh, Beau Revoir and also Mont Brahim. Now, the, the 22nd Battalion had been uh, withdrawn on the night of the 5th and 6th of, um, of, uh, of October. But they were, they were replaced by an American, a fresh American regiment called the 117th. And volunteers were, were asked for in order to guide the Americans onto the, to, to the job. And, and, and Ozzy Hunt, he put his hand up and did that. But it wasn't just a case of him taking them to, uh, you know, showing them where the line was. The Americans came under heavy fire. The commanding officer became an, a casualty. So Hunt took them forward to the yacht, 
Then the attack started, and as the attack started, he was on the job watching this happen. He could see that a section of men were held up by a, you know, a, a particular strong point that the Germans had. So he, he asked permission from the, from the Americans and he ran forward, took control of this unit and then managed to um, clear that position and then off they went. So, so I think this does two things here. One, it shows what Beaton talked about earlier about the Australian, particularly the private, being a leader of men. You know, people, men of all nationalities will look up to him. And, um, you know, and, and this was certainly the case. And then the other, the other thing is, if you see here, we've got district court martial and distinguished conduct model here. Both of them are frequently abbreviated by DCM. So as we are finishing here on the case studies within the 5th 22nd, I think you can easily see here that you can use DCM in equal abundance for an Australian soldier. It could be to do with discipline or it could do with, to do with bravery. And with Oswald Hunt, it's for the same man here. So we're moving towards the con conclusion here and the approach to discipline amongst the World War combatants changed. Now we talked a lot earlier on about the use of the death penalty and how, how important that was, or it seemed to, there seemed to be a correlation to be between in, uh, in discipline in the Australians versus the rest of the British army. But if you look against the, the, the German army, they use the death penalty less as well. Uh, they only had 48 uh, executions out of 150 sentences. And Ludendorff towards the end, he suggested that the absence of a much stricter British style um, uh, punishment there would have, would, you know, would, would have been better and you know, for Germany's outcome in the war. Now, when it comes to the French, uh, they, sh they actually shot, executed 600 um, of the 2000 sentences. But as we know, their, their greater use of the death penalty did not stop the French army mutinies, nor did the fact of the reintroduction of the Roman practice of decimation in 1916, because there was a mutiny that took place in the Italian army. That didn't stop the ill discipline within the Italian army. And it was more down to the Im impact of leadership, training, morale. These were far more important. And then the Russian army, discipline was poor there. They, they reintroduced um, flogging at one stage in 1915. But as we also know, in 1917, the whole of uh, sort of uh, military discipline broke down as part of the, uh, the full scale, scale revolution. So you can't just say that um, it's all down to the use of things like the death penalty. And I think overall, if you think about what military discipline is, and it's ultimately designed to prepare men for the traumas of battle, that the British army over of the centuries that uh, we have you know, helped to, or had the half the world painted pink, that the British Army and the, and the discipline in the, in the army was effective in controlling the army to do the will of the politicians of that particular time. So we're now coming towards the conclusion about the, looking at the discipline and the effectiveness of the AIF. And, and it, I would say it's a game of two halves, really. Um, I hope that's not a, a wrong analogy to use, but despite early failures at the beginning of the war with Gallipoli, the disaster at Fromelles, which was still the ranks as the worst day in um, Australian uh, military his, history, Poisier, Bullcourt, and then there was a, a distrust of the British High Command, uh, that the AIF developed into one of the most revered fighting forces of World War I. And I think things started to change at Messines when it was a much better, well-executed, well-planned operation um, under, under Plumer's command there. So things started to change there with, uh, with Messine, and that was actually uh, used uh, Monash's third division there. But the effectiveness really started to grow uh, when they worked together side by side. And that first happened at uh, Broodsinder here, 
We're the first Anzac course, so we had the first and the second division next to the third, and the New Zealanders all attacked in the area around Zonabic up to Tynecott. The third division took where Tynecott is now. And for those that of you that know the the um, the Passchendaele Museum at, at uh, Zonabic, the lake behind it, behind you is the exact point that the 22nd attacked on on that day on the 4th of um, October. And, and, and Plumer uh, hailed it as the greatest victory since the Marne. Uh, so it's, and, and it also represented the high point of the third Ypres campaign. And, and then where they really made their name was in 1918 with the defense as the, as the Germans were pouring westwards, uh, the defense uh, around uh, Albert, Dernancourt, Morlancourt, down towards uh, Villers Bretonneau, then the use of peaceful penetration which kept the pressure on the Germans with these, these, these miniature raids. But, it, but, the, but the Australians also realized that by doing small bite-sized attacks, it, it was better for them in their survival than a, a full-scale uh, major attack. So, that, so they actually realized it was better, even though it was gonna be very, very scary, scary for the people that, that uh, took part in it, that uh, to, to actually keep the pressure on the on the Germans through th something called peaceful penetration, and there was the the the, um, the, the well documented attack at Hamel, which was uh, the you know used Monash as the blueprint for the eighth of August uh, attack, and and then of course the uh, the Black Day itself, the German army, the eighth of August, where the four Australian divisions they leapfrogged each other. Uh, with the with the Canadians on the right hand side, so so you know the the effectiveness of of the Australians really came to the fore from March 1918 onwards. At the very very point that everything I've shown you before shows you that the discipline was going down. So you know it it it, it doesn't hold that the, the poor discipline at all impacted the effectiveness of the AIF fighting. And if you look about, you know, what people are saying, um, Haig, Haig conceded that Australian battle discipline had held up during the war, despite the poor discipline away from the front. He probably said that through gritted teeth underneath his, his, uh, his moustache. And then also the Australian parliament, um, it stuck to the belief in its men and its senior officers all the way, even then the, where there was pressure coming through and they believed in the leadership, the trainery and the camaraderie on, on the morale. But I don't think it really matters what, what either Haig was saying or the parliament was saying. I think what really, really counts is what the people in France, the people that the Australians came to help liberate were thinking. And, and I think many of you will recognize this plaque here, which is outside the school in Villers Bretonneau, which was the gift of school children of Victoria here, where there is the, the sign, Nublion Jamais l'Australie. Let us never forget Australia. And to this very day, Australia is held in such high regard and affection by the people of this particular area. And so the final two slides here we've got are all the you know, quotes here from, uh, from you know, first of all, from the Premier of France after he had visited Monash after the Hamel uh, victory in, in July. And just summarize here, it says, I shall go back tomorrow and say to my countrymen, I have seen the Australians, I've looked in their faces, I know that these men will fight alongside of us again until the cause for which we are all fighting is safe for us and our children. And then the final words go to the big man himself, uh, Lieutenant General John Monash, who, um, who was the, the corps commander from the end of May to the end of war. And, and he talks about, he says, very much and very stupid comment has been made upon the discipline of the Australian soldier. That was because the very conception and purpose of discipline have been misunderstood. It is, after all, only a means to an end. And, and, that, and that end is the power to secure coordinated action among a large number of individuals for the achievement of a definitive purpose. It does not mean lip service nor obsequious homage to superiors, nor servile observance of forms and customs, nor suppression of individuality. 
The Australian army is a proof that individualism is the best and not the worst foundation upon which to build up collective discipline. And with that, I thank you very much. And uh, this final slide here is actually from the website that I developed, which told the story or tells the story of the 22nd Battalion in real time through the war between uh, 1914 to 1919. So thank you very much. Greg, thank you. That was a thoroughly engaging and uh, in interesting uh, presentation. Just, you can see the round of applause coming your way from the uh, various screens there. Uh, and a very impressive piece of research there. I congratulate you on that. Um, you mentioned the, cross, the uh, practice of larrikin and I'm reminded very much of that scene, you know, what a lovely war where the, uh, which pandas every stereotype there ever was of uh, the Australians and the British, where the Australian soldiers are leaning against a wall, singing uh, one staff officer jump right over another staff officer's back. Yeah. And it, it conjured that to mind straight away. I'm starting to question, I do wonder, uh, in uh, researching the 5th 22nd, did you find any examples of other battalions with an even worse record, to use that phrase? Andy, if I tried to do that, my wife would have killed me. <laughs> fair enough, that's fair comment, yeah. She, yeah. She, she, she says that I disappeared for five years with all the research that I put into, uh, you know, that, that commemorative period. I'm sure. So, so I think it's, a, a, you know, a, a good exercise that someone might want to pick up one day. Well, they've certainly got to, a, a hard act to follow if they can uh, top that one. Uh, okay, yeah. any other questions? Uh, yeah, yes, okay, Sarah, you. the floor um, is yours. You've sort of covered it a bit, but I'm interested in trying to sort of see a comparison between the lack of discipline and lack of almost respect of the, um, the, the, the British High Command, if you like, or commanders in thing, and the French... Um, revolts that happened in 1917. The can you give me a bit, tell me a bit more about why you think the um, Australian thing seemed to be more individual actions? It didn't ever seem to, from what I gather, um, get into a bigger selection, and it wasn't. It didn't ever end up in you know whole group revolts. It, a bit more information on that, please. Well, I think it probably could be summarised in what you actually said there, individual actions. For the, for the vast majority of men that, uh, that signed up and you know, said they were all volunteers, yes, there's this you know, essence of for king and country and we need to go over and fight for the Belgians, you know, that small country being uh, crushed by a, a large power. But at the end of the day, when they got over there, they just felt as though they were men about going about their job. And it was all about doing what they had to do and what their mates were doing. So that so their world was very much in, in their own sort of bubble. I mean, it could, it could be in, in, into a section, it could be a platoon. They, it, so the, so, so they, they, they didn't, they weren't involved in the bigger, the bigger pictures, the bigger aspects of, you know, the French mutinies um, came after the uh, Nivelles offensive on, on the Ain, And um, and so there, you know, thousands sure. and thousands okay. and thousands of Frenchmen were killed yeah. there, yeah. where the Australians are, are, were more introspective, I would say, and really focused about what was important to, to them living their life on a daily basis on, in the front. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And any others? Uh, Tim, you've got, you've got your hand up. Now, I was just thinking, a lot of things have been written about the Canadians and the Australians and the, the Anzacs in general, but the British bog standard soldier, the Liverpudley and the Birmingham, chap from Birmingham or London or wherever it may be, Newcastle, they must have had the same characteristics because most of the people from Australia um, were British citizens or British immigrants anyway. Um, so consequently, it's a bit, the analogy is a bit like the brick wall being built and the Anzacs having the pointing at the end, because there were so many, you know, in comparison, number of British soldiers uh, that fought in the First World War. But it always seems to be that the 
the Anzacs get that little bit of credit. And, and statistically, I suppose, the, you know, what, what is proved by the way they performed and their attacks, et cetera. But it always seems to me that the dear old bog standard Tommy Atkins seems to get left behind sometimes. And, and it may be because of the command structure in so much as the British Army, you know, we, we adhered to the, the rank structure here whereas the Anzacs maybe didn't. But consequently, I should imagine that the, the same performance was put in by the Brits and the Anzacs. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 you know, the British Army, I mean, it, it, did, it did the donkey's work. I mean, the, we, we tend to focus, there's, there is a lot of written about the, uh, the, the, was it five Canadian divisions and the, you know, the five Australians and the New Zealand. So that there seems to be you know, a degree of um, romanticism about, about the, the, the dominions coming over a small number of men. Yeah. But, uh, but, but I think you, know, you could put this collective blanket around, around them. Um, you know, you know, I know I, I, I'm still, don't know too much. I'm not as well versed on the British side as probably most people around here. But if you look at um, the, the, the way the Australians and the Canadians fought, they fought together. I mean, the Canadian nation, they said, was formed in, in you know, the, the Battle of Ar Arras there, wasn't it? So, um, whereas, the you know, you, you talk about British regiments, but what happens to the British regiment? The, the battalions get split up and they go all, up, all over the place as well. So, so, you know, I, I'm not sure if they had, they were able to develop such a uh, esprit de corps that was available to the, uh, to the uh, Dominions. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you think there's any truth, or am I being a little cynical, when I suspect that uh, John Monash got home to Australia pretty quickly, managed to knock out his the Australian victories in France and Belgium by 1919 and got his story in first and was somewhat backed up by uh, Charles Beam, who always mythologised the individualism uh, and the uh, abilities of the Australian uh, Bushmen. And that there, that has percolated down even to today through a contemporary uh, Australian writings. Any does that hold water at all? Um, I, I think being an Englishman living in Surrey as well, I don't know if I if I can say that. Probably, as, as some Australians will be watching this uh, this this later. But you know, I, I think that you know Monash himself. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't actually seen as a typical Australian himself. Um, he was seen as a bit of an outsider. I mean, he he was had you know Jewish heritage as well. So so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that he you know he he fitted the bill of a uh, uh, you know a, a typical Australian. No, I know, wasn't. Uh, that wasn't my point. Yeah. That my point was, do we think that uh, Johnny, Mar Johnny Monash did a little bit of a big up job for his own uh, historical effect? Right. Well, they always say that well, history is written by the victors, so maybe he just got his in um, early. Well, that's my view. <laughs> yeah. well, okay. Andrew uh, wrote his memoirs pretty quickly, as did Hindenburg. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any more? Any more for any more? I can't see any hands up there. No, I think we're just about done then. Okie dokie. Right, well, uh, once again then, Greg, uh, thank you so much for a very, very enlightening and very interesting in, uh, talk. That was absolutely first class. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And this will all be on YouTube at some point in the next few days. Okay, so just to wrap things up then, our next talk is on Wednesday the 18th of August where we will hear from Michael Lucas, and he will be telling us the story of entitled The Frontline Medic, Captain George Perry, Royal Army Medical Corps, uh, of significance to us since he was uh, he served with the 9th Battalion of the East Surrey Regiment, so one unit very close to us. That's on the uh, Wednesday, the 18th of August, and until that time, keep cool, keep safe, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.
Good night. Thank you, everyone. Mademoiselle from Armentier's Parlement.